would apologize for the lack of space. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee to order. Uh, as many of you know, this is not our regular meeting time for a Tuesday. This is uh, a little bit early, and I do regret the early hours for members of the committee. But this is a very important issue that requires our immediate attention. And unfortunately, it doesn't provide us with the normal time frame that we would have to customarily debate an issue of this nature or the, uh, and to accommodate our normal delivery process. And for that reason, as I discussed with some of you yesterday uh, by phone, we will have to observe our normal uh, committee uh, procedure for not allowing for public testimony during the full Judiciary Committee meeting if we're going to make a decision on this matter this morning. I am going to allow the, the customary uh, uh, courtesy that we always extend to the uh, proponent or the primary sponsor of the bill in just a few moments, <coughs> Senator from Anderson, Senator Bright, the opportunity to make some brief comments about the bill. And uh, But we have our able legal staff, uh, the chief counsel for the Senate uh, will also be here. There he comes now. He will be here to answer any legal questions that you might have. Also, we're going to pass out a letter that I received uh, earlier yesterday from the Election Commission. Uh, Ms. Handino wrote me expressing her views about how the uh, how any change in the law would have to be pretty clear. I would also note, for your information, you may have heard, most likely have heard, about the federal suit that has been filed that involves the uh, disqualification of candidates. And just as late as yesterday, I understand a state court suit has been brought over in Florence, I believe. And I believe they're seeking original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. I don't know if that's been granted or not. Regarding the process for certifying the candidates over there uh, under the Supreme Court decision. So I'd like to begin by stating the obvious. We face a daunting challenge uh, to act on this matter without further disrupting uh, this process. Preclearance is required, uh, we believe, for any change in the election law at this point. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I can tell you uh, we can't, you know, these verbal conversations that take place, uh, we don't have documentation for it, but, but our staff has been in touch with the Justice Department, and it's pretty clear to us that any change in the dates, of that type thing, would, would obviously uh, would require uh, preclearance. But if this matter only involved a handful of candidates following the procedure set forth in the law, we wouldn't be here this morning. But we've got about 200 candidates statewide that have been affected by the procedure that basically uh, began in the last election cycle, was consummated, I think, fully in this election cycle that requires electronic filing by all the candidates. And I think there was a big breakdown, obviously, in communication between the parties and the candidates as it related to how that procedure was to be met. And of course, now we have a decision by the state Supreme Court as to how, if you follow the letter of the law, how it should be met. My view, my view of it is, is that we have a tremendous responsibility. I mentioned a daunting responsibility. We have a tremendous responsibility to the issue of fairness and equity. If we can provide that in this committee today and also in the Senate, full Senate later on today uh, and this week. So with that, uh, we do have some, uh, you have, we have the bill before us that Senator from Anderson introduced and before I take any other uh, comments, if you would, I would like to give the, the, the I don't know what his schedule is, just give him the opportunity he, He's going to make it brief, and then finance is going to be meeting. And, and I'd like to recognize, if you don't mind, Senator Anderson, Senator Bryant, to give some brief comments about his bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have finance today, but from the looks of this room, I guess all the crowd's up here. 
Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I want to thank you for this special meeting to consider S-1512. As I said on the floor last week, uh, the bill was a quick reaction to the Supreme Court's ruling causing the disenfranchisement of nearly 200 candidates, Democrats and Republicans alike. I wanted to simply drop the bill in the hopper, generate a debate, and get the first reading since the time frame is so short. I'm confident the process will produce a workable solution. These districts belong to the people. On June 12th, the Democrats and Republicans across this state will decide their respective nominees, and in November, the voters will decide who they want to represent them. The fallout of the Supreme Court's ruling has eliminated nearly 200 candidates, all challenges. We have two sets of rules here. Current legislators are required to file the Statement of Economic Interest by April 15th each year. If we are late, we simply pay a fine, a slap on the wrist. First-time candidates, however, must file the same statement with a deadline 15 days earlier than ours. If they are a second late, they're disqualified. We get a slap on the wrist, and they get the death penalty. That's just wrong. Some are accusing the General Assembly of purpose, purposely setting up roadblocks to protect opponents, and some say it wasn't intentional. Personally, I was not aware of the disparity until last week. I think a blame game at this point is irrelevant and should wait until next session when a permanent fix can be constructed. Let's put that discussion on hold and fix the problem before us as time is not on our side. I ask that you, the Judiciary Committee take S-1512 and amend it as you see fit. This committee's membership and staff consists of some of the state's sharpest legal minds, and I'm confident y'all can find a way to thread this needle. If we don't act quickly, there are nearly 200 legislative districts in which their voters will not have a choice. My suggestion is to treat all candidates the same. The April 15th deadline, five-day grace period, and a fine April after April 20th. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Senator. And I hope the uh, meeting is fine. Let me say this, and I, I appreciate the audience, and I appreciate your being here, but I should have established this as a ground rule. We normally uh, don't, don't do this as much as we'd like, but we do this. The decorum of the Senate is first and foremost in how we conduct our business, and we do not allow applause or, or responses from the audience about what's said, and we just, we just can't. Otherwise, that would get out of hand, but Senator, we appreciate your being here. And uh, we'll further deliberate the bill and try to move it, try to move something uh, to the floor, uh, hopefully today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator from Orangeburg, I believe, would like to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to uh, respond uh, to some of your initial comments and, and to make sure that we're on the same page. I'm, you said that you believed that any change in the date would require preclearance. That's correct. I agree with that. But but one of the proposals would be just to hold the date firm at March 30th, and that would not require preclearance. On what authority do you base that? Wouldn't be a change. We've already been. We, <coughs> the, the law establishes the end of filing is noon on March the 30th. That would not be a change in the law if we did right. that. And that would not require preclearance. And so, and, and we can debate that, and we can right. be wrong or right about that, but the difference is, and without regard to who's right about that, the difference is this. If preclearance is sought, it will delay the primaries. There's just no doubt about that. So if there's any uh, chance that the primary is going to go off as scheduled, then we've got to stick with the 30th as the cutoff. If we move it to the 15th, it's going to require preclearance, which we may or may not get. Uh, but I don't, I don't agree with your assessment that if, if we reiterate the law, if we just say the law is a law, that that requires free clearance. Well, I think the Supreme Court's interpretation of the law obviously is, is something that even some are suggesting uh, uh, 
invites the, the federal folks in. But be, be that as it is, well, well, I, 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 I do believe that any legislative enactment and, and the March 30 day, Senator Marge Burr, would be a legislative enactment. And my, yeah. my, my, <coughs> Senator Marge Burr, I believe any legislative enactment, based on what I'm being told, will require preclearance. I, I disagree with you. Well, and I, and I, and I, and I, I, and I, the, I talked to the constitutional lawyers well, that argue these cases. It, well, and they disagree with that. Well, we, we, we have a different take based on a conversation with the Justice Department. Yeah, but that is and, something and that. And those happen. are the folks that are actually calling the shots. I mean, you make a legal argument, you're still going to wind up in a lawsuit if you well, don't do I'll, it. I, and I'm not, look, I'm going to vote either way. It, sure. I, I, want, sure. I, I, want, I want candidates to get on the ballot. But what I want everybody to understand is... It's not simple. Well, no, that's not what I want you to understand. What I want you to understand is, if you say, if you take the position you take, then we might as well go ahead and now agree that it doesn't matter what we do, we're going to delay the primary. Well, if, that, if that's the ground rules you want to establish, that's all I'm trying to get. Sure, I, and I and I and I, I fully understand. But let me just respond by saying this: and I'm, you know, when I noted those federal, uh, the federal suit, and as well as the state suit that federal we just filed, take preclearance. No, but the state suit that, that's exactly right. But the state suit that was filed yesterday, without question, either one of these or both could have an impact on the the uh, primary schedule at this point. <laughs> Either one or both. <laughs> and, and so I, I think the question before the committee is, is do we, uh, on a policy basis, want to cast the widest net possible if we're going to, if we're going to make a legislative uh, decision, the widest net possible to bring back as many of those disqualified candidates for the public policy reason that, we, that we've all aware of, or are we going to restrict it to the to the prime to the filing time, which is my understanding, Senator Marsburg, that would only pick up probably about I know about a quarter of the Republican candidates that were disqualified. And I have have you seen the list for the Democratic side? Pick up forty. Forty, so that's about half. Mm -hmm. So it would pick up let's see, forty, uh, sixty. Uh, that's about a third. It would pick up one third of the disqualified candidates and leave out two thirds. I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to, to argue for the 30th over the 15th as a policy matter. I just want you to understand if we choose anything other than the 30th, there's no doubt we have to get preclearance. If we choose the 30th, we can argue whether we do or we don't. The other alternative is, of course, if we pick the 30th and the federal judge tomorrow picks the 15th, then we're probably home free because no preclearance is required because he's a federal judge. That's correct. You're, you, are, you are correct on that. Senator from uh, Darlington, Senator Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I am want to join into this this discussion. I agree with you and the Senator from Orangeburg to a, to a, to a certain degree. But I want to start with the premise that one, what we all should know is that the resolution that is before us don't does not have the full effect of law. It um, <coughs> it is not going to make us do anything. It's, um, it, it 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 does not make us act, and it doesn't have a binding effect as to what occurs. The question that I would have is, is that um, we got to make certain that we understand what the lawsuit did and what the lawsuit really um, describes is a distinction between those that are, that are exempt and those that are not. Sure. And so we're talking about apples and oranges. Those individuals that had filed initially with the economic interest then they have the public official um, um, tag, and therefore they're exempt. So the real challenge in in the lawsuit was whether or not individuals were exempt whenever they filed their economic interest. Those that were exempt did not follow the same criteria, and so it it um, <coughs> from a layman's standpoint, it appears to be um, some some inequities there, and there. It probably is because this is America. Everybody needs to have an opportunity to have access to the ballot. Should be able to be on on the ballot. I think there's some unintentional, some unintended consequences here. It wasn't um, it wasn't planned, but when the initial bill was filed in 1991, with uh, the after effects of Operation Lost Trust, 
then there was some intent there to make certain that the public was was, was aware whenever there was a, um, the um, online statements that was filed by a few House members back in um, a couple of years ago, it wasn't read together. And apparently now the Supreme Court, they're just there to interpret. Um, I don't believe that we would have Justice Department pre-clearance approval if we kept the date at March 30th under certain circumstances if there is no changes. And so what happens is, is that I'm curious as to what's happened with what was um, what happened in the preclearance information, the documentation that was sent back from March 30th, whether or not our facts and circumstances are inclusive. Because if there's another review, then there needs to be another review. Now, I will, um, I will be the first to say is that I am happy to end up allowing folks on the ballot. I think it's um, probably the right thing to end up doing, however you get there legally. But I am not for, for attempts in this body to skirt preclearance. We're under this for a reason. And what I want to make certain is that if, if we're going to end up making a change that is meaningful, then we have to have the appropriate review. And I'll caution us also as to the equal protection issues. I'm anxious to see what the federal judge will end up doing. That um, um, and we have to make certain whenever we're going forth to, to end up saying that are we keeping folks from the ballot? And if those um, if with with the matter that is pending in the courts now to see who is joined. And I agree with your last premise. Whenever you said that if if the judge rules Wednesday that they go on the ballot till April 15th, then I think case is closed. So this. I'm anxious to see what we're going to do. We got a resolution here. It seems that we're going to have to agree in concept today as to what we're going to do. Sure. Moving forward, or whether or not we have a another bill. I understand from our conversation yesterday that there may be another bill that we can amend and send back to the House of Representatives. Right. I think first thing we need to do, uh, Senator Darlington, is, uh, and I know there's going to be from Senator Charleston, Senator Camps, and a, a proposal that he and I have have worked on to present to you this morning. Uh, but there needs to be uh, something in front of the committee, and, just, and we'll do that in just a moment to, to sort of accelerate the discussion. Uh, is it okay if I recognize the Senator Charleston, Senator Campson, to explain what would be before us? Senator Charleston, Senator Campson, uh, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess the first thing I want to do is place this in, in context because the truth is, no matter what we do, um, we are in a bit of a catch-22 um, between preclearance and trying to do something that our state Supreme Court would uphold. Um, and, and the two, I think, are not mutually exclusive, but there is some tension between the two because in order to retroactively fix this, um, I think it's important that we couch the, the, the amendment, and I have an amendment I'm going to explain later, that the amendment needs to be remedial and procedural. And I say that because I'm looking at a, um, a 2005 decision, JRS Builders, where the court, the holding in that case was that um, the General Assembly can't pass a law the effect of which is to undo a Supreme Court decision when they've construed a statute. That causes us some difficulty in this instance because, um, however, in, in his dissent, I think Justice Placonis made a very good point. And, and the point is this, that if the legislature's response to a Supreme Court decision is procedural and remedial in nature. And if anything is remedial, this is remedial. We're trying to remedy a wrong or a, a, an effect that has been very devastating on an electoral process. If it's remedial and procedural, um, then it's, then it is not, Baconis has argued that it should not, and he cites some authority, that it should not just be out of hand 
dismissed by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional because it's trying to undo a Supreme Court decision. So I think it's important from a legal strategy to, to craft an amendment to this resolution that provides a remedial and procedural change. And to do the remedial and procedural change, we will have to do more than just change the March 30th date. We're going to have to go in and change the statute to make it remedial in nature. I think that's our best shot of getting it past the South Carolina Supreme Court. And um, I know that we have to get pre-cleared. We'll have to ask for, for expedited pre-clearance. Hopefully the Justice Department will see that, um, that this is something that is worthy of pre-clearance. And the remedial nature, if this is going to be a remedial response, what we need to do is put both public officials who, current, who have to file statements of economic interest on the same footing and treated the same as those who are not public officials but seeking public office, the same requirements, the same statement of economic interest, put them on equal footing. And that's the only thing that is really remedial. Um, that's, that is the only thing that will really get us past a equal protection challenge, in my opinion. And so I think that we need, need to take a, adopt an amendment that is remedial, that is procedural. This is really about procedure, when you have to file what form, what year the form has to be. Um, the truth is, what, what's in the current statute, what, what really creates the problem in the current statute is that a, a public official who currently has to file a statement of economic interest, yeah, he has one on file or she has one on file, when filing closes, but in most instances, the one that's on file when filing closes is the one from the year prior to the year that the <coughs> candidate, who's not a public official, um, statement of economic interest covers. Like, we don't have to file statements of economic interest as a matter of course until April the 15th each year for the previous year. Filing closed March 30th. The statute gives us credit for the one that's on file, but the one that's on file as of March 30th is, in this instance, from 2010. Whereas the candidate, who's not a public official, his or her statement of economic interest is from 2011. So it's covering different years. And so if, it's, if we're going to have a remedial response to this, to remedy this inequity, this differential treatment, we have to go in to the statute and change that. And I understand that will require preclearance. Frankly, I think changing the date requires preclearance too. Now, perhaps I'll be proven wrong and I'll be open and to hearing that I'm proven wrong on that, but my understanding is any change to our election laws, we're going to have to, we have to get pre-cleared because we're, we're voting rights, we're subject to the Voting Rights Act. And so that's the basic structure of the amendment that we're going to propose, that we change the submission of the statement of economic interest requirement to make it the same for all, whether you're an elected official or whether you don't hold public office and you're a first-time candidate. Change that to um, require the statement of economic interest or, an, or evidence of it being electronically filed must be submitted to the official with whom you file your statement of intent to stand for election. So the county party chairman, when you go to file, in fact, the proposal that we have would provide that that statement of intent of candidacy is not effectual and cannot be accepted by the public official who is to receive it unless they receive confirmation that you have filed a statement of economic interest electronically with the election commission and when you file those you get a receipt that confirms you filed it. That must be submitted before your statement of candidacy can be accepted. That would be applied to both <coughs> elected officials and newcomers who are not elected officials but are running for office on equal grounds. That's the remedy and I think again I think Justice Blaconis is right in his in his dissent in JRS Builders that um, <coughs> that we can pass retroactive laws. There is a constitutional provision in Article 1 Section 4 that prohibits ex post facto laws but that is understood to apply 
has been understood to apply only in a criminal context. When it comes to civil laws and procedure, we can do that. Um, we give strength to our argument, I think, before our state Supreme Court if we are doing it as a matter of a, rem a procedural change and a remedial response as opposed to directly trying to just undo the decision they made. If we just directly try to undo the decision they made, that old doctrine that we've debated over the last couple of years in this General Assembly in numerous fronts and numerous contexts, the separation of powers doctrine comes into play. You can't just make a direct assault upon a Supreme Court decision and undo it. That's, that's judicial authority and that judicial power is immune, really, to a direct a legislative assault trying to undo it. And so we have framed this in a way that is, I think has the best chance of getting past our Supreme Court it's remedial, it's procedural, and that's why when you read the amendment, you'll see a pre some findings and a preamble that talks about it being remedial and procedural. The, the difference is this. We can't pass, in a civil context, we can't pass a retroactive law that disrupts any vested rights. But if it remedies a situation, if it's a, a change to a procedure, we can do that. Now, there are no vested rights in this instance unless someone would argue that a, an incumbent has a vested right to not have someone who, uh, run against them. And there certainly is no vested right in that, in that sense. And so there's no vested rights that are being, being disrupted here. Um, so we think, and, and I've worked with the chairman and staff over the last over the weekend and the last uh, and, and, and very intently <coughs> yesterday in trying to fashion a response that would be an amendment to this bill. Now we have to amend the resolution for various reasons. Um, the, the, the resolution just changed the, the filing date until sometime in May. Well, we have a lot of practical problems with that because the ballots, the absentee <coughs> ballots have to go out at 30 days before the election. Um, for for, for um, overseas military voters, it has to go out even longer than that. And uh, the ballots were supposed to be certified last Friday. Um, so we can't just take the approach, although I, I appreciate the senator from, um, from Anderson uh, introducing this joint resolution last week, but we have to really make a dramatic change after looking at all the factors, um, many of them because of the timing and the calendar. We met with the Election Commission with Marcy Andino. She has laid out those problems in a letter, and that led us to this response. And I think this is our best shot. I know we have to get pre-clearance. I can't do anything about that. None of us can do anything about that and make it get away. What we can do is with unanimity um, communicate with the Justice Department how important all of us think it is that this preclearance happen and it happened soon. Um, and the other thing is the, just, the, 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 um, the Election Commission has to keep working until there's a final piece of legislation passed, keep working as if the status quo is what's going to prevail until the primary day. And so we need to get this done as quickly as we can and we need to get an expedited response from the Justice Department. And I want to make one last point. This code section was amended last in, in 1991, this, this provision that, that um, provides an, an exception for an elected official who has a statement of economic interest on file. Um, in fact, the chairman indicated to me last week that he, that, he, that he served in the legislature when that amendment was adopted and it was kind of a, an afterthought, yeah, well, we already have these statements filed, so why do we have to file again? And no thought was given to the fact that you're filing for different years. Um, now, I've heard many, some have said that this is some kind of grand conspiracy for elected officials to close the ballot off to others. I can tell you this, if it is such a grand conspiracy, it is the most poorly executed conspiracy that I've ever seen because this change happened in 1991 and the conspiracy didn't come to fruition until the conspirators, almost all of them are no longer in the General Assembly, 
except for our chairman. <laughs> and, um, uh, maybe he's the sole conspirator left. <laughs> but everyone who, who was involved in conspiracy, most of them are gone. They're no longer elected officials. And it never came to fruition until 2012, tw uh, tw 21 years later after the change. So this is, not a res this is not about the good old boys and girls trying to keep people off the ballot. What this is, is, is about this. The, um, our laws are imperfect because they're enacted by imperfect human beings who are not omniscient, um, who are not all-knowing, and we often make mistakes. There are often unintended consequences for what we do. When I say we, almost none of us were here back then when this happened. But this is a product of that imperfect process that is, that is conducted by imperfect human beings. And it's not a conspiracy. But if it is, it is, the mo it is the most poorly executed one that I've ever seen because yes, the conspirators sir. didn't benefit from it. But that's our approach. I think it's important to take this approach in order to help us pass muster in our state Supreme Court. All right. You, before we go any further, I'm several of you got questions. Going to get to everybody. Is there a second to the motion uh, for the pending amendment? He did. He proposed it. It's passed out. He passed. It's, it's right in front of you. He just. He just proposed the amendment. There is, there is a second to the amendment, and now the dis, the question and discussion will proceed on this amendment. Senator from Orangeburg has a question. Um, Senator from Charleston, I appreciate what you said, but I, I don't think I could disagree completely more. I mean, absolutely. Completely? Not, completely. With everything? Everything you said. So you think it was a conspiracy? No. <laughs> I'm telling you, well, it, may, it may have been, but what you are, you are subjecting to us in this bill that we lacked a rational basis for setting up, uh, and, and that's all we required is a rational basis, and the rational basis was this. Elected officials are required to file every single year. Candidates are only required to file in the year that they file. That is a rational basis. So you can't tell me that 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 that, that we lacked a rational basis. I don't. I'm not opposed to the fix, but I am opposed to the premise that somehow that what we did was was not thought out. I mean, we had a scheme set up that says everybody. I don't care if you're on the, you know, the in the legislature, on city council, or whatever level. Every year that you're in public office, the public deserves to know what potential conflicts of interest you may have. And we set that up for some, they gotta do that every year, and they gotta do it by April 15th. I don't know if we picked that because it was tax day or why we picked that day. But when we set up a, 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 a system for filing for candidacy, we did that with the um, prospect we were gonna have a June primary. To have a June primary, we knew we, need, knew we needed filing to end by March the 30th. And so we set that up. It was going to be a duplication of effort to require somebody to file something twice, 15 days apart. We could have, in a perfect world, moved the date for annual filing to March the 30th to coincide with the end of filing. But, but, to, but to premise the bill on the fact that there was no rational basis for what we did is wrong. And that's well, why... Senator, let me, let me address that. The difference is... And, and, and this is a big difference, and there is no rational defense of this, and that is that the statement of economic interest on file when, a, when an elected official files, if he's relying upon the, the, the normal annual filings, is for the year preceding the year in which the new candidate has to file a statement of economic interest. And that's the greatest disparity right there. For example, this year, if a candidate who is an elected official was relying upon the fact that, that, that he had a statement of economic interest on file with the Ethics Commission at the, mo at the time they went and filed between March 15 and 30, or 16 and 30, whichever it was, um, their statement of economic interest was for the calendar year 2010, the one that was on file, and the new candidate, the candidate who's not an elected official, who had to submit their statement of economic interest when they filed, 
had a statement of economic interest for the year 2011. But the reason <laughs> that's is reason, stale. The They're, reason that's meaningless is that the reason that a statement of economic <laughs> interest is filed is so the voter will have knowledge when they go to the polls and vote. Nobody was going to the polls to vote until June. So they were going to have these done by April the 15th. Uh, and, and so full knowledge to everybody who needed to know, they were going to have every piece of information they needed to know in a timely fashion, months before they had to vote. It was going to be a 15-day difference, but nobody was going to vote in that 15-day window. That's why it didn't matter. But I'll tell you that, you know, when I filed this year, I filed the whole thing, just like a candidate would, because I, I, I went above and beyond the law, but I right, did it. Right, well, and I think a lot of us did. In fact, we told all of our incumbent uh, senators to do that, to, to, to go ahead and, and do that, but it wasn't required. And the reason it wasn't required is what you're trying to convey to the public is full disclosure of a person's economic interest in a timely fashion. The fact that, it's, the fact that we triggered it for the, the non-incumbent candidates earlier was just to make sure they got it done because we really had no, not, not the same control over them as you do the incumbents, because the incumbents are subject to the fine mechanism if they don't do it on the 15th. But the candidates, this was, our, was their initial filing. Well, Senator, can I ask you a question? You mentioned March 30th. Who do you want, um, who, who do you want to have, have to have filed by March 30th or they're booted out? Do you want only I'm the not new candidates to or you want the where, new candidates and, and the incumbents? Clear. I'm not trying to boot anybody out. I know you're not. I'm, I'm just not. trying to tell you that, number one, I believe if we stick with March 30th, we can hold primaries in June, and I just want people to know that, because if you think a June primary is important, you got to stick with March 30th. For, for who? For anybody who's filed either electronically or paper by, by the 30th. I think that would be the remedial, right, they would be non-exempt. That would be the remedial. Only for the non-exempt folks. Yes. I think that would be the remedial step we would take. Now, if you don't want to do that, and I'm not committed to one way or the other, I just want to be clear that I think there's a way you can have the primaries in June, and then that every other way requires the primaries to be in August. And, but what you've said is that we're trying to fix an equal protection violation. I believe that is non-existent. I don't believe there's an equal protection violation because I believe we have a rational basis for setting up two different schemes, one for candidates and one for people who have to file every year, even in off years. So I'm not opposed to what you're trying to do, but I am opposed to you telling me that, that, that we are acknowledging that we did something wrong, because I don't think we did, and I don't think, I think if an equal protection challenge is brought in the courts, I understand maybe there is one. It's going to be found to have a rational basis. We had a rational basis for doing that. That's not the premise. I think the premise is when we went to electronic filing, we probably didn't publicize that uh, uniformly to everybody who needed to know what the rules were now that the rules had changed. And that would be the remedial nature of what we would be trying to fix if we want to stick with March the 30th. But if you don't want to stick with March the 30th, then I'm not saying I won't vote for that. But I don't think you can premise it on the way you did. Well, Senator, let me say. It, what I said is not premised upon an equal protection challenge. That's what the amendment says on like the first line. It, it's um. Well, let me let me just say this. Get back. Get as far and as a sponsor of the amendment with Senator Charleston. What we were trying to do was address the retroactivity of this thing. It is a, 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 a remedial. We're trying to get it past our Supreme that's Court right. more, than, more than an equal that's, protection. That's what we're doing. Sure, and that is, that is we're trying to do something procedural and remedial. We're not directly right. just trying to undo their decision because the holding in JRS Builders is when right. the court has interpreted a statute, we just can't retro pass something that retroactively undoes that judicial decision and it's mainly targeted at that, not the not the equal I just protection think argument. A more narrow way to do that without without bringing this equal protection argument into the mix. All right. We got we got to do one at a time and I apologize. I think remedial <laughs> means you have to change the agreement. Yeah. 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 The result is admirable. We think that's right. The result is fine. The logic is flawed. The first sentence says we make findings of the general assembly regarding the disparate treatment. And I don't think that we can operate from that premise because the premise is, is that you're dealing with exempt and non-exempt individuals. Well, and so, the, and so I, I realize that is that in the general public, we want folks to all file and folks all to know we want as many people on the ballot as, as possible. 
But the thing is, is that this Supreme Court de de decision covers those that are not exempt, and that's and that's the whole problem. I'm for the logic of getting it to a point that we can get the folks on the ballot. But the question is, is that when you when you draft it the way that we got it drafted here, uh, I disagree with the. We have to have a starting point, and we and you we, we well, you can offer a friendly amendment maybe to to, to change can that we, language. Can we can we then move to to change the premise um, with the language where you where you acknowledge disparate treatment? Um, because the thing is, is that you you're acknowledging the premise that that some of us don't think from a legal basis is there. I want to get to where you're going. Right. Well, they, well we, Senator, we, they I are. don't want to write on your they, vote. Well, let me just say this. As a sponsor of the amendment, there was disparate treatment. I mean, there was disparate treatment in the sense that As it if, to if you didn't file that, and, and if you didn't file, not only if you didn't file it online, if you didn't hand them a paper copy of it, according to the state Supreme Court in its ruling, you're off the ballot. And if that's not disparate treatment, I, I mean, we're just stating a fact and Senator Buford from a legal, maybe one last point. It's disparate treatment when you start talking about people, but what we're talking about is a legal issue. I want to get to where you're going, but the thing is, is that it's, um, I want to make sure that we can get there in the same boat. The the disparate treatment that you're talking about is, is that how does it work when, whenever the two people would be similarly situated whenever they're on on the ballot, but they're not whenever you start talking about exempt and non-exempt. And so, if you have a, a economic interest that's on file, then it's current. That's the language. See, the, the, the Supreme Court, they're not trying to treat us different. They're just trying to interpret what we did. And what we did was we had, some, we had something that was in our laws that had to be read together, and we didn't read it together. And I don't believe justice read it together whenever they listened to it in 2010. I don't think that justice went back and look too to see this is what they did in 1991. They looked at, at the law that we ended up having and they read it together and I don't believe that they, that they read it together as well. So my last point is this, people should be treated the same. That's the equal protection. What we did though is, is that we, we treated them, uh, we, we gave them a different category to stand in. And so that's why you cannot compare it. Now, if we can get an amendment that we can put folks on the ballot, I'm for that. And you can put it whenever, you can reopen it for what I care. But the thing is, is that the issue um, is, is this, I think it's legally flawed. All right, Senator Buford, and then, then I'm gonna move around. We're gonna, we're gonna get to everybody. Senator Thanks, Buford. Mr. Chair. I, I, would, I, I speak in support of uh, Senator from Charleston, Senator Kenshin's uh, amendment. Um, and, and I disagree with my friend from Darlington um, that this is not violative of the state's equal protection clause. Um, this is clearly violative for three reasons, I think. Um, you're treating individuals in the same context as public officials who are, or as individuals who are candidates for public office differently in three ways. Uh, first of all, you have the requirement that they have a paper ballot that they deliver uh, in addition to electronic filing. Second of all, you have a different deadline in regard to when they have to comply with that, March 30th as opposed to April 15th. And third, you have a different penalty that is associated with the new person's failure to file. In the case of the public official, they pay fine. In the case of somebody who is filing for candidacy for the first time, they're off the ballot. So you've got, you've got three particular ways in which individuals who are competing for the same office and should be dealt with equally, in three different ways, you're treating them disparately. And I think this amendment is absolutely correct that it's violative of equal protection. In fact, I can't think of an instance more clearly where it's violative of equal protection. It, the, it, you cannot tell me that there is a rational basis for penalizing an elected official fines for not filing a state of economic interest on time, whereas the penalty associated with a challenger is to be off the ballot entirely. There is no rational basis. Um, there's a basis, but not a rational one for having disparate penalties associated with not filing. Even if you accept the premise that it's okay to have a higher threshold for new candidates, even if you accept the premise that they have to electronically and hand deliver a paper ballot, even if you accept the premise that they have to do it by March 30 while incumbents have April till April 15th, how in the world is it rational for the remedy to be for an elected official's failure to meet the April 15th deadline, the extension, to file a fine or pay a fine where the penalty associated with somebody who's, who's challenging that incumbent is they're off the ballot entirely. 
And that is completely disparate and completely vile of legal protection. Thank you. Senator from uh, Kershaw and then Senator Charleston. Thank you. I'm Senator from Charleston. I had a question. I'm concerned, but I want to get away from some of the philosophy about it. And I want to talk about the practical aspects of what's going to happen because I'm concerned that the way this is drafted, if you look in um, B, that th if we pass this, it'll kick off, kick people off the ballot who otherwise would be qualified to be on the ballot. And it says, notwithstanding the deadline for filing an updated statement of economic interest, the candidate who's a public official must electronically file an updated statement of electronic interest for the previous calendar year prior to filing a declaration of candidacy. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical and you can walk through it. What section are you reading? B, 8-13-1356. B. B. But it was B, you're striking, okay. so I guess it'll be A. Right. If you have a person who filed a paper form when they filed their declaration of candidacy, and which is what the state Supreme Court tells us is appropriate, I think this language would kick them off. Senator, I would, I would ask you to look to section 3 of the amendment. Section three, the person and item two, the person electronically file the statement of economic interest uh, with the state ethics commission prior to the, uh, or it might might be you might all put in there with the uh, uh, appropriate uh, regulatory body or how that's referenced in the section, but that covers the, the that element of the retroactivity. Well, 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 why is A say what it says then? Because, because that's, that's, a, that's the permanent change. That's the permanent change that treats everyone on equal footing. And then section three is the, is the, that's the permanent procedural change, puts everyone on equal footing. Section three is the remedial action we're taking in order to um, correct this <clears throat> but this catastrophe this occurred. Three is assuming that the person electronically filed it. <coughs> Let's assume you got people out there who filed the paper copy that didn't electronically file it. And you're about to kick them off the ballot where I just heard a great speech from the Senator from Beaufort which says that, you know, if they're late in filing it, what they're supposed to get is fines. No, look, at fine. look at number one. The number paper, one of, the, of section three. Every question you've asked is answered in section three. Okay, that's, 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 that's what I'm asking. Well, and I'm, and, I'm glad, and I'm glad you are. The paper copy, he provided a copy of his statement with his declaration of candidacy. That that covers the written. Okay. No, no electronic. Two, person electronically filed the statement or an updated statement as applicable with the State Ethics Commission prior to the date for public officials. Which is uh, April 15th, sir. Including in any administrative grace period. Which so if you electronically filed it or if you paper filed it. Which would get, get us to what day? Gets us to April 20th. Okay. All right. I miss. Oh. Yes, I'll go ahead, Tim Trump. No, I'll go ahead. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, here's, this is a bigger concern I have because I really don't want to make the situation any more chaotic than it is already. And I'm very concerned with pushing the primary dates back. In fact, I, I do not support pushing the primary dates back. Um, if the basis of this is equal protection, which is what I hear you saying? Well, no, I, I would say this. I would say there is a tension, I believe, on the one hand between an equal protection challenge and the precedent of our state Supreme Court when it comes to passing legislation that directly <coughs> attempts, attempts to directly reverse a holding of the Supreme Court. I think there's a tension between those two precepts and pre-clearance by justice. Right. Please. Now, and I think you got to pick one or the other, really. Because um, I do think that, and I think the senator from, from uh, Beaufort made, you know, articulated it very well, that you have different treatment based right. on whether someone's an incumbent, and the biggest different treatment is the consequences right. for violating this section. One's kicked off the ballot, one gets a slap right. that, on the wrist. to the equal protection and, that and the president of our Supreme Court, and so, and there's tension. I'm not sure that you can reconcile pre-clearance with those two. I haven't found a way to do it. I don't know I'm, what you mean I'm, by that when you say I'm right. Side, I'm <laughs> on the side of passing muster in our Supreme Court, <laughs> passing an equal protection challenge, and then hopefully the, the Justice Department 
will understand that folks on both sides of the aisle, on all sides of any aisle, want these folks who have, who have registered, who have put themselves up for public exactly. service, not to be knocked out on a mere technicality because of um, a, a, a provision in the law that um, you know, we probably should have caught years ago, but we never did. All right, well, I want to be real practical on how to solve this problem. So it's that tension. Because pushing the primaries back is not a solution to the problem. If there's an equal protection problem that's as obvious as the senator from Buford just stated, 